back with John Krosnick, who is a professor of communications, political science, and psychology at Stanford University, uh, presenting or, or is an author or co-author on a whole load of papers, as he always is at, at A4 conferences. Um, one of the subjects that has been bubbling at this conference is the topic of surveys that are drawn from panels of people who have volunteered to do uh, surveys, which I should say, interest disclosed, includes polymet YouGov Polymetrics, which is the principal sponsor of Holster.com. Um, but I want to ask about that, uh, just simply as a consumer. Uh, we, we know there's a, something a little less random sample about uh, those kinds of surveys. But how do we make sense of them? Uh, you know, should we be looking at them? And if so, what should we know about them? So uh, to, 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 to uh, how, how can we judge their quality? So OK, to start with, the, a key point is to recognize the overwhelming popularity of this new methodology. That uh, I've heard figures today saying more than $2 billion worth of business sold in the United States in the last year from what we'll call opt-in panels, um, more than $4 billion worldwide. And so it's clearly an approach to collecting survey data and that are appealing. In that sense, you're saying popularity among commercial market uh, uh, market research, uh, not the political surveys we tend to see uh, on pollster.com. We see uh, more of them, but not. Well, I, I, there are plenty of academics who are analyzing those data. Um, there are certainly plenty of political surveys okay. that appear. Um, whether they appear on pollster.com or not, they right. are certainly appearing so there. Uh, in they're the there. blogosphere. And, right. Um, the, and certainly the commercial world is very interested in this methodology as right. well. Okay. And um, for myself, personally, I'm all in favor of new methodologies and being creative and finding ways to be efficient and effective. And so the minute any new technology comes along as a way to collect data for surveys, it seems to me worth investigation. I'll be honest with you that 10 years ago when um, the idea of internet surveys in general uh, was introduced to the field, and I will never forget, people from Knowledge Networks came to Columbus, Ohio, where I was on the faculty at the time, to sit down with me and tell me about this new company they were creating and how they were going to do internet surveys. I, I just, you know, did all I could to not laugh at this idea because I just thought it was preposterous. And the reason I thought it was preposterous is because I had come to believe that self-administered surveys involved inevitable problems that um, interviewers could solve, that interviewers could engage respondents and motivate them and pace them through a conversation in a way that we would get better quality reports from individuals and that a paper questionnaire, uh, it's as if that last question on the paper questionnaire is calling to you, come to me, come to me, and then right. you, know, you, you rush your way through that paper questionnaire and even if it has advantages about your willingness to reveal using illegal drugs or um, cheating on your income taxes, that that may easily be counterweighed by sloppiness in reasoning and thinking and self-judgment and so on. Um, so I well, you know, how's the internet different from that? And I, when it became clear this was a, a method that was going to gain some traction, I was quickly interested in evaluating its performance and was stunned to find that internet surveys with probability samples produced better results, more accurate results, than RDD telephone surveys were at the time. And I just never expected that. I tried to turn the data upside down to say, how did we make a calculation mistake here? What could possibly count for this? And we couldn't find it. You know? and so um, now when, when the idea of um, expanding this methodology more with non-probability samples, with uh, essentially opt-in groups of people where you throw a, a net out and, and scoop them up, um, you know, let's take it seriously. Let's give it its, its due examination. And so I think certainly evaluating the quality of data is important there because the claims that we've heard from that community of researchers is that those data are quicker to collect than a telephone survey or a face-to-face -face survey, which is absolutely true, cheaper to collect than a telephone survey or a face-to-face -face survey, and that's maybe true uh, depending upon who's charging what prices, and more accurate than those probability methods. And the typical uh, explanation for that is that those probability methods are, are tanking, that response rates on the telephone are going down lower and lower, that cell phone only households are outside of the frames, and as a result, we have a situation where what we used to think, based on sampling theory, was a terrific method in practice, mm -hmm. is no longer working. So the, the bottom line question is, uh, how do we, is there a point uh, that we can conclude 
that a survey done from a panel of, of uh, volunteer respondents and, and made better uh, through some means is as reliable and as accurate as the other methods available to us and how will we know when we get there? Right, so that's exactly the question to ask. So in other words, when the purveyors of opt-in samples say our samples are more accurate, what evidence are they looking at? What evidence can we look at? Um, and, and in some objective sense, determine that. And so I think there are two parts to accuracy. One part is the precision with, with which any one person reports something about himself or herself, and different modes and different panel arrangements might lead some respondents to be quicker and sloppier versus a little more thoughtful and more careful and accurate. And the second question is, regardless of how accurately these people describe themselves, how accurately do they as a group describe the population? And that's the sampling connection and the generalizability issue. And we have various methods on the table to address these issues, and I think the, the most obvious approach is to take aggregate statistics that we get from some other non-survey source, whether it's the federal government's report to us about how many people voted, or the federal government's report to us about how many people voted for a particular candidate, or the federal government's report about how many people have a passport, or uh, a state agencies' reports about how many people have driver's licenses, and so on. Ask those questions in a survey where normally, why would we ask that in a survey? We can get the real number from some other source, and then we compare those survey results with the benchmarks to find out how accurate they are. Uh, when we ended the interview, I ended it a little more abruptly than Professor Krasnick realized uh, sooner than he thought I was going to end it. Um, and so on reflection, we wanted to give him the chance to answer one more question, which is, so you did these studies to evaluate uh, accuracy of different kinds of surveys, what did you find? So what we've been finding in the work we've done and what others have been doing elsewhere and publishing uh, actually around the world is that uh, studies that are involving probability samples over the internet have been strikingly accurate, quite consistently, in capturing demographic variables and capturing non-demographic variables where there are benchmarks to look at. Um, in contrast, what we found is that the surveys done over the internet with non-probability samples of volunteers, um, typically if you look at those data before weighting adjustments are made to correct for observable discrepancies in demographics, that those are notably less accurate than the surveys done with probability samples. And that's not surprising. The history of survey research is that probability samples are typically based on a theory of representativeness that, that, bears on, that bears through. There are some firms doing non-probability internet surveys that have produced breathtakingly accurate results after the weights are turned on. And so the magic there appears to be in the weighting. And most of the non-probability survey companies that we've seen don't do weighting that produces results like that. And so I think the question is, are those results, um, because they're confined uh, almost exclusively to elections, in fact exclusively to elections, where telephone surveys have been done in advance and the internet weighting can be done to take into account the signals sent by the telephone surveys, um, would those same uh, improvements in accuracy occur due to weighting where there is no train of telephone surveys to help in advance and outside of the election context? And that's what we uh, have not yet seen. We have not seen weights solve those problems in those cases. Okay. Well, thank you again. Thank you.